Have you ever wondered what Horizon Zero Dawn conceals off camera during its opening chapter? There are definitely some sites to take a look at, ranging from interesting to downright peculiar. Such as, just what exactly is happening to Aloy's leg here? In this video, as well as more to follow, we'll be taking a look at how the game works behind the scenes throughout a playthrough. This video will cover the events that occur from the beginning of Aloy's adventure up until her encounter with the Savage Sawtooth. Grab your bow and supplies for our journey into this post-apocalyptic world, and I hope you enjoy. To get things going, let's start off with a short recap of the game during this time frame. The player begins the game having to navigate a young Aloy through an underground cavern system, encountering ruins nearly a millennia in age. It is here we obtain a focus, a piece of technology from the old ones that is extremely important for Aloy's journey as it provides insight both into the past and the world around her, especially the machines living in it. After finding our way out of the cave system and reuniting with Rost, Aloy's adoptive father, we embark on some survival training that serves as a tutorial for the game's combat and basic mechanics. We will also be meeting Teb and a heavily armed Nora Brave before heading off to hunt a sawtooth on our own. One of the first things I did when Aloy fell into the underground caverns was, of course, take a look around. As I did this, I inevitably ended up pulling the camera farther and farther out just to see what I could find. The map in Horizon Zero Dawn is truly vast, and as I pressed further away from the cavern, I was really able to take in the scale of it all. There were some interesting things out there that I stumbled upon during this camera flight, the first of which was the border of the fully rendered terrain with its low detail counterpart. This is clearly done to save on system resources on things well outside of a player's normal sight distance. Speaking of borders, here's a small bit of lore related to the map itself. Though there are clearly some creative liberties taken with regard to distance and placement of landmarks, the game takes place across a number of the western states in the US. The influences of places like Colorado, Arizona, and Utah are plain to see across the detailed landscapes that we see in the game. It's pretty interesting to look into if you have the time. To truly grasp the map's scale, you have to travel quite a distance. And in doing so, I came across the terrifying Stormbird that is encountered later in the game. Being beyond the render distance, the massive machine looks like it belongs in a PS1 era game as opposed to the PS4 or PS5 generation. Low polygon counts and muddy texture resolution are the norm out here in the lands beyond the full render distance. But not everything is restricted in this way. While looking around, I did find that the game's road signs still appeared in their fully rendered state out here, as well as a pack of machines that seemed to retain their full detail. The map also hides some other details beneath it. Grid-like geometry can be seen, as well as these gray squares that are placed all about the space. It is likely that these are used for object placement and measuring distance. If you have an idea of what these are for, chime in on the comments. Returning to Aloy after she makes her way out of the ruins with a small hand up from Rost, we set off to embark on our survival training. Our basic maneuvering and combat techniques are taught to us and eventually lead to a cutscene featuring Teb, a young Nora tribesman practicing on the proving obstacle course. Cutscenes in this game, as well as others, are typically constructed with many shots from different angles. I broke the camera away here at the beginning of this scene because I wanted to see what was happening during these different shots while characters were out of frame and, behold, Teb flies right up the side of the cliff in order to be in position for his next scene. Speaking of, when Teb lands on the log along the side of the cliff, his leg completely twists and contorts. Teb, are you okay? Who hurt you, buddy? Honestly, Aloy isn't doing too much better herself during this turn of events, as we can see if we turn the camera back toward her and Rost. Both of Aloy's legs are twisting as she seems to be held in the air like a puppet on a set of strings. Yikes. After these aerial acrobatics, Teb is called away by the voice of an older tribesman. But don't worry, we'll be meeting that man and his crew very soon. After Teb is called away and Ross speaks with Aloy about their status within the tribe, or rather, outside of it, the game progresses. We are reunited with Teb in short order after he slips and falls off of the obstacle course and lands amongst a pack of machines. After rescuing Teb, we find ourselves in another scene which puts a face to the voice we heard earlier, an older tribesman and his crew who appear to scold Teb for even looking in our direction. With so many characters on screen during this scene, I of course wanted to see what kind of weird things were happening between camera shots. After pulling the camera away to take a peek, I certainly was not disappointed. While the leader of the group speaks, the other tribesmen periodically disappear, leaving floating spears behind. This certainly gives new meaning to the upcoming chapter titled The Tip of the Spear. 
doesn't it? After scolding Teb, the group walks off and eventually vanishes behind a large rock from where they originally came. The entire interaction leaves Aloy understandably frustrated, which only serves to leave her distracted as she walks away. The next scene this immediately leads us into is interesting for a couple different reasons. Aloy is struck in the head by a rock thrown by Bast and a small group of other children up on higher ground. If we change the camera angle after Aloy is injured, we can see a few things happening with Bast and his crew, namely where they are or are not standing. One of these kids is apparently gifted with psychic powers as depending on the timing during the scene, we can see them either standing upon a levitating stone or they could be simply floating in the air. Jokes aside, this is mainly to give them greater visibility during the camera shots looking up at them from below. Eventually Bast, feeling smug and full of himself, decides to throw another rock at his target below. However, Aloy catches this stone and leaves Bast with a look of surprise on his face. Upon shifting our camera angle here, we can actually see that there's a second model of Aloy present during this part of the scene, which is probably only adding to Bast's confusion. Given the positioning, it is likely the second model is here for the end of the scene when Rost arrives, as by then we are back to only having one hero in present. Aloy, frustrated, resolves herself to conquer the proving herself after these events, and we move on to her training montage and following time skip. As we head into the final part of the game's first chapter, Aloy is now a young adult seeking to prove herself. <laughs> see what I did there? Proving? Prove herself? I'll see myself out. Upon seeking out Rost, Aloy is presented with her final task before taking on the proving. Night falls after a day of gathering supplies and rest, and Rost guides Aloy beyond the gates, somewhere she has never been, in order to hunt something she has never seen. After passing by wreckage and remains from previous hunts by the Nora tribe, a scene unfolds where we are first introduced to her target, the terrifying Sawtooth. Now, I was interested in exploring this area to see where this large monster actually comes from, but as it turns out, it simply pops into existence out of thin air. This is common in games, and it may very well be that it was present and simply had its visibility turned off until it was needed. Because of the nature of how this cutscene plays out, we can see this large machine appear, disappear, and stand completely stationary while the camera moves between the angles of the cutscene during normal play. Essentially, whenever the camera isn't pointed in its direction, it isn't doing anything at all, if it's even visible to begin with. All of this brings us to the end of the first chapter of Horizon Zero Dawn, as we look ahead towards the proving and the events it will bring with it in the second chapter, along with undoubtedly more strangeness to come. I hope you enjoyed this first step into the Horizon journey. If you did, leave this video a like, and subscribe if you're interested to see the bizarre things that surely lay ahead. Until next time, friends, peace.